Hi there, welcome to some breaking news regarding the Riley Strain case. Whilst details have come out about his bank and card activity on the day he went missing, leading up to his disappearance, nothing else was revealed after that point, so that's interesting. What else came about, though, which we're talking about right now, is from what the mother had to say, the family in general, with some additional details that weren't mentioned before, okay? I'm going to summarise what was mentioned from the news interview so you get a better, better idea of things. I can add on with my points and analyse if necessary and even compare contrast to what we already know of within the case. There are a lot more questions than answers now. We'll see what happens next, of course. If you are interested in my earlier breaking news on the case, which I did earlier today, be sure to catch up on it top right corner of the screen where that eye symbol is. If you click on that, you'll be able to find a video and you'll be able to watch it, okay? Welcome to those that are currently here in this live premiere. Feel free to share your thoughts, opinions, reactions in the live chat box and anyone in general, if you've got any thoughts or comments, questions, list them down below under this video and I can always respond back to them at a later point. Down below, you'll also find a pinned comment by me with some additional links if you wish to check them out, okay? So, in terms of the order and style of this video, it, it will be similar to how I've done things with the Dylan Rounds case and interviews, as some of you will be familiar with. As for other people that are new to my channel, just try and be patient and hopefully you'll be able to understand what I'm getting at and the style of how I do things, okay? I will make some references to earlier on's video because there's some important points to be made, okay? But I'm just going to read out in the order of, you know, what was talked about in the interview. So first and foremost, mentioned about the card activity, okay? So this all occurred, in case you're wondering, the 8th of March 2024 in Nashville, Tennessee, okay? You've got Riley Strain the original missing person, then later found in the river, dead, okay? This individual went missing on the 8th of March, later on in the, um, you know, in the day, uh, but earlier was with his fraternity brothers hanging out, going to bars, more than one, which we heard about just recently, having drinks, having a good time, but it didn't end in a positive outcome for Riley. Trying to understand what's going on there, okay? So with the card activity, from looking back at the latest news interview, which actually presented like um, a photo, a map of the, the streets and the names of the bars. I can't remember all the names, but you can always look back at the photo from my earlier video today, okay? Four bars visited by Riley Strain. Okay, and this is traced and tracked from his card, his bank activity. So making purchases for drinks, if there was any food involved, you get what I'm saying, right? What I will mention that is interesting is that it was said that when Riley was found, his body in the water, his trousers were missing, his shoes, boots were missing, and his wallet. So I guess in his wallet would be his card, so his card was missing. I did see a comment just recently claiming his card was found. I don't know if that's true. I don't know where it was found, if that's the case. If anyone can confirm it or debunk it as BS, let me know down below, okay? But even if it was found, was there any activity on that card after the passing of Riley, or any card activity once and after he was kicked out of that fourth and final bar, right? From the looks of it, no. All the activity was when Riley was alive and was visiting each bar from one to another. Total of four bars, the first one called Miranda or so, then there was a second one, the third one being Kid Rock's bar, and then the fourth one, the one what we've all known, okay? As I said, for named locations, references, I did a video earlier on, okay? They are close proximity to one another. I think some are on the same street as well. 
So with them being close together, you can understand why you would go from one to another. There wouldn't be too much danger there, I guess, if you're crossing or walking across. Um, it might be populated, but more so people walking about. But what about onwards? You know, if you're walking back to the hotel, different story, right? And Riley was in that situation by himself. So he was vulnerable in a way, okay? So with understanding the card activity that Riley was at multiple bars before he went missing, it puts into perspective that there's a chance that there was a bit of alcohol con consumption, right? Whilst at first we only heard about the one bar where he ordered a alcoholic drink, rum and cola, well, rum and coke, okay, coke being Coca-Cola, in case you're wondering, okay, ordering just that one drink and then being kicked out shortly after or so and then stumbling about on CCTV footage. Yeah, when just hearing about that bit, you'd think, how can one drink have such an effect on someone? Unless that one drink was spiked and then you felt side effects shortly afterwards, that would make sense, be possible. If it's all coming down to just being drunk, because supposedly from the autopsy report said no foul play, okay, the water not being found in lungs, meaning he didn't drown, does raise suspicion because it means he would have died and passed away on land before he ended up in water. So someone must have put him in water or he somehow accidentally fell into water, right? So there's that to take in mind. But the key thing was that they said no foul play. So it kind of contradicts one another if you think about it without thinking too hard, okay? Maybe there's things and factors to put into perspective to prove that there wasn't any foul play, but that hasn't come out just yet, okay? And we'll return back to that later. But they didn't say that anything was found in his bloodstream or in his system, okay? So if he was spiked, they couldn't find it when the autopsy report was done. The chances are that if Riley was spiked his drink, okay, whatever was in his system at the time, by the time he passed away, by the time he was found, it probably exited his system, expired, so you wouldn't be able to trace it. If Riley was found on the same night he passed away, then likely an autopsy report would have yielded different results if he was spiked because it probably would still be within his system at the time, right? But because he ended up in water and it was like 14 days later, things would have passed through his system by then and maybe simply being in the water as well would have caused some kind of, I don't know, flushed the body if water went in the mouth or the nose or so, if, if I'm correct in saying, okay? So as for tracing back things, it's not as easy to do when the autopsy report doesn't show anything that's odd or suspicious. So the next thing you would have to rely on is CCTV footage to see if you can see any strange activity from anyone near to his drink, whether it be when serving it or someone next to Riley at the time holding or having the drink near a table. If someone just walked past and poured something in, well then obviously there's a high chance it was spiked because strangers don't just casually walk by and pour something in your drink. They only do that when they're trying to spike you. Why do humans spike other people's drinks? To take advantage of them if they want something in an intimate, physical way, and that tends to be targeting females, but it can apply to males as well, but it tends to be more so females there. But the other situation which can be universal is you get spiked, you become vulnerable, you may pass out, and then they can steal items off of you, okay? And in this case with Riley, if he was spiked, which one would probably follow on? What would you think? Do you think if he was spiked, was the motive behind it because somebody wanted to inappropriately do things to Riley, or slash and, depending, to take things away from him, like his pants, his shoes, his wallet. But then again, if his card was found, supposedly, or at least it shows that there's not been any bank activity since, then maybe the motive behind money taking something from Riley wasn't the case because surely there would have been some kind of transactions by now if it was money motivated, money driven. 
You don't, if you were going to spike someone so you can take stuff from them and then use it for your own gain, well, that would, would make sense. But if there's no like activity with money or anything, it's like, well, why take it if you don't intend on using it? Because surely, because what else can you do with it? You got to draw the money out somehow. If it's just a card you've got, unless his wallet did have money in. But due to the transactions and the, the bank activity from his card, well, it looked like he was paying for it for his card rather than in cash, in coins, right? So that's got to be taken into consideration, okay? So we talked about that earlier on, okay? But you can always look back for the named locations and the visual explanation behind it so you truly understand the depth behind it and the proximity between the different bars, okay? It will help put things into perspective for you. But that was like the first thing talked about within this news report. Then it transitioned onto the direct interview, mentioning and questioning about the rum and coke, which was a text message, which was never talked about beforehand or released. My question to you would be, why now? Why has it only now come about if the mother knew about the text way back at the start? Why was it not mentioned earlier on? I'm not too sure. Maybe uh, there was a response yielded through the lack of results from the autopsy report claiming that there was no foul play. So now the mother has thought, well, you know what? You say that there's no foul play, yet I've got evidence here that could suggest there was. Maybe that's the reason for why it's only come out now, because back then she didn't think much of it. But within this news interview, Riley's mom or mother, however you want to pronounce it, okay, talks about the text conversation at the time, March the 8th, when Riley said he had um, a drink, rum and cola, and it tasted funny. It tasted like barbecue. And, you know, with the exchange of conversation saying, well, it's probably not good, it doesn't taste right, and probably you should stop drinking get. Now, the questions behind how much did he drink of it is unknown. Did he drink it all or did he only have a little sip? I wonder. Now, if he didn't finish the drink, but it still had a possible effect on him, it kind of puts into perspective that a possible spike to drink can have such an effect on you, even if you don't consume it all, right? So there's that to take in perspective. Now, the interesting thing that was brought up along the theme and topic of them, the family, suggesting that maybe his drink was spiked, the, the guy with the, the long beard, the stepfather, I think it was, mentioned about with the, the talks and the conversation about town in the area of Nashville, Tennessee, that town um, Riley was in, when speaking to Uber drivers and people within the area that would be transporting people from bars to hotels or to home or vice versa or from bar to bar, you know, it'll be a business in the area because if people are too drunk to make their way back home by themselves, they'll probably need picking up in a taxi an Uber driver. And from the conversations with the family and the Uber drivers, they were talking about how there's some shady stuff and patterns going on in the area, that like there's something not quite right in that town. So if if Riley's drink was spiked, supposedly it's not the first time. So is there a, a key individual or multiple individuals out there in that town purposely spiking people's drinks? then taking advantage of them afterwards. I wonder, what do the reports say there? Now, in terms of deaths, there was no mention of that. So could it be on this one occasion that things went worse, went wrong? So the person spiking Riley may not have wanted to kill Riley, but wanted him to be unconscious at least so they could take advantage of Riley or take stuff from him, if it was like um, a robbery, let's just say. Um, and because Riley wouldn't be able to fight back because of being under the influence of something, it would be an easy target for the attacker, right? But on this occasion, uh, maybe too much stuff was added to the drink or it just had a bad reaction to Riley specifically, so things backfired and went wrong. But did it stop the individual? Probably not. They've not come forwards. They've not confessed. Obviously, it does not 100% prove to say Riley's drink was spiked but at least from the ideas there's a chance and from the conversations with the family and uber drivers within that town supposedly things like that have happened in the past and there is a bit of a pattern 
going on there. So if it really did happen to Riley, well then it would mean it's not the first time to happen to someone in terms of a drink being spiked. In terms of a death though, maybe it is the first time in a while, just putting it like that. I want to know your thoughts down below in the comment section or in the live chat. What's your thoughts about hearing about the Uber drivers talking about there are patterns in that town that things like this could have happened previously and are ongoing? You know, if the area, the town has such a bad reputation, then why hasn't anything been done beforehand? Why has there not been any prevention, any cups where the... Um, the lids are sealed on top of the drinks to prevent people spiking drinks. You know those anti-spiking drinks or kits for safety? Why has that not been enforced if things like this have happened in the past, right? Was Riley even aware of that type of activity going on in that town? Probably not. And even if there was some talk about it, maybe at the age they are, they wouldn't really be thinking or prioritising that at the time. There could be even a very small chance that at times, males may not think it concerns them, right? Because, I mean, it happens in the UK, drinks being spiked, you see it all on the news, but normally, most of the time, the people targeted are females, right? That's just how it seems to be. Um, it doesn't seem to happen as much to males, but it can still happen, but maybe not as much. So in, in, the, in the eyes of males, although they might not get targeted as much, the more likely to be impacted by it because they're not taking the same precautions. They may feel invincible and untouchable that it doesn't target them, but it can at times when they least expect it, hence why it has such an impact and effect on them, right? I think at the end of the day, the best way of wording it is anyone's drink can be spiked. If the perpetrator has a true motive behind it, they want something from you and they will spike you so they can get it more easily and have better access to it, whatever that might be. So was Riley caught up in something at the time on March 8th? Did he come across someone who he was unaware of and they wanted something of him or, you know, what's going on there? Now, I did mention on the sideline that was there a small chance and possibility that maybe at the fourth and final bar that his drink wasn't spiked, but maybe his fraternity brothers played a prank by pouring some barbecue sauce in his rum and cola. I mean, I've seen it on YouTube where people have poured ketchup, tomato sauce in somebody's Coke from McDonald's or Burger King's. And then the unsuspecting person ended up taking a drink from it and was like, oh, what the hell's this? I saw another video somewhere where someone got one of the uh, dipping sauces, put it inside of the drink and then sealed it all up with the straw going into the dip rather than the liquid around it. And then when the person sucks into it, yeah, they got an unpleasant taste. Is that something what the fraternity brothers did on Riley Strain at the time? And there's a chance that maybe at Kid Rock's bar, that's when his drink was spiked because he spent more time there over an hour. So the more time you spend at a bar and the more drinks you have, the higher the chances that maybe one of them could be spiked. And depending how long it takes for it to go through your system to take full effect, from leaving that bar to going to the new place, the fourth place, the final bar, then it's starting wearing on the individual at the time and the drink tasting funny is just a mere coincidence if it was a prank played by the fraternity brothers do they feel like that they're responsible for doing that prank and it went wrong and they feel responsible for the death and they've not said it or anything then they've been quiet or if you used to scrap that aside could it just simply be that that one drink that tasted funny was the drink that was spiked I'm trying to understand it I also add the other final factor in if, if he was spiked earlier on, could it have impacted his taste bud when he went to the final bar to take a drink of the rum and cola? You get what I'm saying? If you're under the influence of something and if it impacts you, whether it be your perception, your balance, your vision, or even your taste, your senses, it alters it, 
maybe the next thing you participate in doesn't quite feel the same and it feels wrong, doesn't feel right. So there's always that chance. But let me know the chances down below to what you think about him and his drink being spiked. Is there a high chance or a low chance? And if there is a low chance and it's not likely, how else and what else do you think was responsible for Riley passing away and passing away on land and how he ended up in water? So let me know there, okay? So besides the pattern in town with the Uber drivers and what they've seen and witnessed with drinks supposedly being spiked, in terms of the autopsy report, which the family brought back up in conversation, the stepfather talking about that there was no proof of like an accident. And he was also saying that if there is any proof to show to me that it was accidental, then do it. That's fine. It'll make more sense. But there isn't any proof, or not at least yet, that's come out as proof. There's no like CCTV footage to show him stumbling, hitting his head and then rolling in the water. There's no footage of that. It's just the only footage that you've got and the only evidence says you see Riley walking down a street, walking across a sidewalk, stumbling about. And then the stories from the homeless people saying that he was stumbling over and fell into a bush. And then the only other piece you've got is then... 14 days later or so, body found in the river, but no sign of drowning. That's it. There's no, like, footage of him dying at the time, video footage of him falling into the water or passing out on the floor, and then that being the end. That's all missing. So there's a there's an important, crucial blank spot. So a bit of guesswork in between, and also working back to the last thing Riley was participating in, and how one thing could link with another. So that's why we talk about the bar, that's why we talk about the drinks and the, the one drink tasting a little bit funny because that's all you can work off at this moment in time. Now, that sort of stuff and area, the, the beginning of the night, if you want to call it that, could all be ruled out and debunked if they get to the CCTV footage, okay? That moves on to the next point, which what the family was saying and the mother, that we need CCTV footage of the bars to see if there was any unusual activity, if there was a killer or someone responsible in those bars or one of the bars in proximity to Riley, right? So if there was CCTV footage of a person spiking his drink, the cameras would show it. But that hasn't come out yet. So that's still in the process, trying to retrieve the footage. Would it be possible by now? It's probably a chance, to be honest. I mean, with it being in a populated area, surveillance, of course. With the cases I've looked at are in remote areas where there's no surveillance. So there's more chances that there'll be success here. Now, as for the CCTV, it was said that the, the final bar had about 136 cameras within the place, supposedly. So that could yield some kind of results and it should have different angles of activity going on and surely at least one of the cameras would show Riley in the bar with his fraternity brothers, right? I mean, one thing I would suggest or question is, is there any CCTV footage of Riley possibly going to the toilet at any point? Sometimes if you go to the toilet or go somewhere where you leave your drink unattended, that's the key time when a drink can be spiked, okay? I mean, the absolute worst case scenario and there's not much you can do about it is if the spiker was somebody that was a bar staff member that served the drinks as risky as that is for them if they were responsible you know when you go to a bar you don't think about it but if you did you would put your trust in the staff that were there and served the drinks that they wouldn't be causing you trouble that they wouldn't be spiking your drink right? It would be anyone else in the bar at the time if you left your drink unattended for. If you're at the bar and you're served a drink and you grab it immediately, it can't be spiked, right? Wrong, because on with the odd exception, sometimes a person that works at the bar can be the one spiking the drinks. It might not be as common, but it can happen, and that's the worst case scenario because you put your trust, you lower your guard to those staff members because you're waiting for the drink and you're not going to question them 
or you tend not to, unless you might overthink situations or you might be extra alert and cautious and you don't trust people. But most of the time, people won't second guess or question, right? So the CCTV footage is very crucial with the bar because it could reinforce the idea of a drink being spiked or it could debunk it all. And if it debunked it all, then it would mean surely then it's after he's left the bar, right? But in terms of his movement, his behaviour, how he's walking about, could you say there's still something there? Yeah, surely there would be some kind of influence from being at one of the bars to end up stumbling about walking, you know... If you went on a walk or you went into a restaurant or a fast food place and everything was normal, nothing was spiked, nothing was altered with, you had a normal meal, a normal drink, or you just simply went to a park and then suddenly you started walking out of somewhere and you're on camera and you start stumbling about falling around, how does that just suddenly come about, right? Out of nowhere. It, it seems a bit unexpected. But... You know, if you've been at a bar for some time or you've been to multiple bars, then you could say, oh, falling about a drunkard, a drunk individual. So if there is no evidence whatsoever or CCTV footage to say that anyone spiked his drink, if that is ruled out, one thing that still remains is he probably was drunk at least. He would have had to have been for him to be in the state he was on camera. So... Even though being drunk may have not led to direct death, it would have made him vulnerable and a danger to himself and the hazardous environments he may have been walking by. There's always still that very small chance that did he trip or fall, but there was no reports about any damage to the head, so maybe that rules that out, right? How else do you just suddenly pass out? Was there any autopsy reports on choking on vomit? Not from the looks of it, but how would you be able to prove it? Maybe not. You know, if for whatever reason it was just pure alcohol and being drunk from it and falling over multiple times, is there a chance that the final fall, he landed on the ground with his face up and choked on his own vomit and died that way and then somehow ended up in the water? But still, to die on land then end up in water there would have to be something to cause you to roll into the water likely um, and if not that then the only other way would be to be picked up by something or likely someone and then thrown into the water and why would anyone do that chances are if that was the case it would probably be someone trying to dispose of the person that they may have taken out now, it still makes me think back to, was there someone in the bar and did they follow Riley out of the bar if a drink was spiked or not? There's that to take in consideration. There are times, though, where somebody could be in a bar and there is an attacker in that bar too, scouting them out. They may not, they may not spike the person, but the victim could already be drunk, so they're vulnerable. And then as they're making their way back home, the attacker stalks them and follows them back to a certain point and then strikes. So not everything always resorts into spiking a drink, but it can still always be a person in the area in the bar or a bar waiting for their moment to strike. And if the person's drunk, sometimes that's more than enough to see them as an easy prey, right? So there's different ways about it, okay? So we're still waiting on CCTV footage, at least at this moment in time of recording this video, okay? Um, some other points that were mentioned, which kind of highlighted earlier on in the video, but from what the family was saying, that when Riley was at those different bars, for example, the third one, Kid Rock's Bar, spent a total of uh, one hour in the bar so you know having a decent time in there decent length maybe having a couple of drinks who knows what the drinks were like though maybe they were okay but then the fourth and final bar only 21 minutes spent inside until he was kicked out and why was he kicked out well that's the one thing that doesn't seem to be mentioned or explained was he kicked out for not following the procedures inside and the rules? 
Was he being too noisy? Was he causing a commotion, disruption? Was he being argumentative? You know, was he causing any threatening behaviour or any room for concern in the eyes of other people in the place? That doesn't seem to be mentioned, right? So it's a bit uncertain that. But if he was drunk, well, sometimes when you're drunk, you can be ordered to leave because you've had too much and you might not be respectful. If you're under the influence of something, it can be the same outcome. If there's any room for concern or room for harm for any of the staff or people that work there, um, general public that are inside, you might be ordered to leave, right? At the end of the day, Riley did leave. So there wasn't really a standoff. So you got to acknowledge that at least, but 21 minutes in that bar. So from spending an hour at Kid Rocks to then spending only 21 minutes in the uh, Luke's, I think it's called Luke's Bar. I mean, what what's your thoughts on that? Let me know down below. Did it only take 21 minutes from entering Luke's Bar to then ordering a drink? you know, consuming so much of it and then feeling the side effects of it. I guess it depends how fast or strong a spike drink would take on the body and maybe it wouldn't take that long. So a 21 minute stay in that bar for them to feel some side effects to then possibly order two glasses or bottles of water to try and wash it out or because you feel a bit off, you may start detecting something's wrong. So the next, the first option is, right, I need some water and that doesn't cut it, and you start feeling worse and showing symptoms, side effects, and in order to be kicked out, leave, and you do so. And then from there, it's a bit of a spiral out of control. I mean, the news report was talking about how spiking can lead to outright death, and the person should be charged for that, charged for murder, if someone is involved. So I saw that mentioned later on in the news programme. Now, some additional key details that were mentioned from the family, which have never been brought up yet until now. Make sure to listen on in. Going on about how the fraternity brothers of Riley Strain, the friends and former high school friends all together. But these group of guys and possibly girls, but I think it was more so just guys, just guys, brothers, right? They didn't call the police. Called the mother, the parents, about not being able to find Riley. It wasn't immediate though, but it did occur eventually. But in terms of calling the police, it didn't seem to happen. There wasn't any urgency there. I mean, it wasn't quite clearly mentioned in the interview. It did say over 14 hours of not contacting the police. So maybe after the 14 hour mark, they then, they then contacted the police or more so by then, the family did contact the police themselves and then the police communicated with the fraternity brothers, possibly. 14 hours in total of not doing anything. Why is that the case? Shouldn't the fraternity brothers, those that were in the care and in the presence of Riley Strain at the time, surely there should have been a bit more concern and worry. You know, if you can't find him, well, where he's at. If you remember the last thing he said, oh, I'll walk back to the hotel alone and he may have seemed a bit in a state, then surely you'd be worried and thinking, right, well, if he's not here, maybe he never made it back. Maybe he's out on the street. Maybe he's in danger. We probably should contact the police because then they could step in and help. Yet the fraternity brothers never did that. They didn't call the police within the first 14 hours or so. And obviously the, the first few hours of a person, well, the first day or hours of a person going missing is the most critical time in order to try and establish leads and find the person before they do, let's just say, pass away if they've gone missing because the, the more time they're stranded or missing for, the survival rate will obviously go down. So action is needed as soon as possible, yet the fraternity brothers didn't do that. There was no urgency, there was a lack of concern, and that's from what the parents have said themselves. So that could seem a little bit suspicious, right? Is it because the fraternity brothers weren't taking it that serious at the time, or is it because they were in pure shock that they didn't know what to do, or is it because them or some are responsible for his death and they don't want to come forwards or say anything? I said I've given multiple options as to the possibilities behind it. I guess because they did at least reach out to the mother, the parents first, that's something. 
Maybe they didn't know what to do. Maybe they didn't know who to contact. Maybe they felt if they contacted the police somehow they would get in trouble or they don't want to be questioned. Well, that would highlight suspicion, right, wouldn't it? Maybe contacting the parents, they would be more understanding and that's why they did that instead of reaching out to authorities immediately. But if you want a true resolve, you should be contacting authorities first and foremost because then they can do more and act quicker and then contact the parents just after. It didn't happen in that order. So that's room for concern, room for questioning and room for suspicion. Let me know your thoughts down below regarding that. Okay. The next point mentioned was the fraternity brothers went to the formal after being with an officer. So I think this is all occurring the night after he went missing, Riley Strain. So the night after going missing, and I believe this is all still in Nashville, correct me if I'm wrong, you got police presence, you got the, the parents coming on down into the area of Nashville to figure out what's going on. And upon that happening, an officer being present within the area, roughly, you know, talking it through, filing it out with the parents as to what's going on and the, trying to retrieve information and make sense of the story. And from what the mother said when that was going on, there was a time and period where the fraternity brothers were with a police officer. So talking it through, any details, what was going on, can you tell me anything, you know, that type of behaviour. And as said, the night after, the night after Riley Strain going missing, shortly afterwards, the fraternity brothers went to the formal, I, I guess it's, is it a party? So you got the build up to the formal the night before, the night Riley went missing. So they go for the drinks, to hang out, to have fun. And then the, the following day, night time, you go to the formal, where I guess maybe everyone all comes together for the, the, the formal gathering, if that's what it is, to do with what university, right? It's just a bit weird, isn't it? So the night Riley went missing, the fraternity brothers in his presence didn't take action, didn't contact police, didn't really do much. And then the day after, okay, the night after he went missing, those fraternity brothers, who should be concerned and worried, ended up going to the formal, some kind of party, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that's what normal people do, you know. You've witnessed the loss of someone or someone you're close to or around has gone missing. Yeah, let's go and have a party the next day. Let's pretend like nothing ever happened. It just doesn't seem quite right. Is it because they're grieving? It'd be too soon to grieve when you don't know what's happened to the person. Yeah, they're missing, but is it that chance early on that they could still be alive? But in the eyes of the fraternity brothers, it was like, oh, well, never mind, we'll just carry on with our life and never mind about Riley Strain. Oh, well, not much of a friend, are they, right? And a little bit suspicious. And, you know, with being in the presence of that police officer at a certain length of time, those fraternity brothers, whatever was talked about or discussed, and then straight after that, going to the formal, putting on the clothes, changing the clothes. It's like they, they couldn't wait to to leave the officer they couldn't wait to see the officer goodbye and then get on with their own life and have fun and continue on in life it seems like the lack of well there's like a form of urgency to get away from the whole Riley strain situation and move on with life so quickly yeah you got the parents obviously putting in more time and effort and worrying because it's their son right the other key point to mention, and this was occurring the night after Riley going missing at the time, the family on that day spent about four hours searching in the area, different hospitals, you know, buildings like that where a person could end up if they were found injured, harmed, fatal, a uh, wound, any kind of injury or trouble a person was in, if they were, if they sent themselves into the hospital. ER room or if a passerby saw someone passed out on the floor or unconscious a call made taken to the nearest hospital or so you know that type of stuff and like if you're on a night out and you're drunk or under the influence of something and you are unconscious and someone sees you they probably call an ambulance or paramedics whatever 
um, or if the injury is worse, then same result, right? So it makes sense as to why the parents would go about different hospitals just to check if he checked himself in or if someone checked himself into a place like that after a night out. It makes total sense. But after spending four hours, the family, they didn't find anything. They didn't find him, right? Because obviously in the end he was found in the river. But unknown to the parents at the time, they decided to check the hospitals. Now, upon returning back to a certain area and being in some kind of van, I don't know why the parents were in a van, whether it be their own van or something to do with the police, whatever, the family did see the fraternity brothers or some of them later on returning back or passing by the family, waving like this. Doesn't that seem a bit insensitive and rude with what's happened to Riley Strain, the parent's son, going missing, worry, concern? And what's the first thing Riley Strain's friends can do is come back from a party or a gathering, smiling and not showing any form of respect, not showing any form of concern or worry, just continuing on with their own selfish, possible narcissistic lives. Yeah, maybe you could argue and say that's a lot of people nowadays and the, the newer generations of people, less loyalty, uh, less respect, it is what it is and it can occur in many different countries, states and whatever, right? There's a lot of cancerous humans out there. There's a lot of hollow, weak individuals too. You might think they've got you back. No, they haven't at all. They're not, they're not even in the headspace for considering you. It's all me, 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 entitlement. So does that link here? Does it highlight that throughout one's life or a certain period of life that Riley Strain was surrounded by bad influences and bad people? What's going on there, right? These are just ideas at this moment in time and simply opinions based on what the family has said and the lacklustre approach by Riley's friends. On the day he went missing and then the following day afterwards, moving on like nothing ever happened, it does seem a little bit strange and questionable, right? I can understand that there are moments where a person could be grieving in a different way by getting on with life and continue working with whatever job they've got. It's like they're trying to block it out because it's a form of a defence mechanism within their mind. They don't want to upset reality because it's too upsetting. I get that. But because it was so early on, the same day and then the following day afterwards of him going missing, at least then, there was still hope that he would probably be alive and he could be laying low somewhere or staying, stopping by at someone else's place. And there was no proof early, early on to say that he was dead either. So there'd be no reason to grieve that early on. Does that make sense? Now, is there a small chance that the reason why 14 hours later the fraternity brothers didn't contact the police is because the first thing that came to their mind was he's not in danger, he's probably just being picked up or he picked up someone, a female. I don't know. I don't know if there's any relationships in the background if Riley had a girlfriend or not. I don't know for context there, but could the fraternity brothers be thinking, oh, Riley, he's gone off on one. He's probably hanging out with someone or some other people. But you got to ask yourself, does he normally do that? Because if he doesn't, well, then there'd be room for concern because it's a change in behaviour. It's not like him to do that. It's not like him to be late. It's not like him to be a no-show, right? If he did do those things, then maybe that's why you wouldn't expect anything odd or strange. But considering that they did contact the mother, the parents about, you know, Riley Strain's parents about him not returning to the hotel, there'll obviously be some room for concern for them to contact Riley Strain's parents to let them know they can't find him. So something must be wrong, right? If nothing was wrong, then there would be no reason to contact anyone, right? Or... If you are in a situation where you are truly responsible for taking someone out, then there would probably be less reasons to why you would contact those people, the parents or the friends. You wouldn't do anything. And equally, you wouldn't do anything if there was no room for concern. But there must have been concern, subconsciously or to an extent, for you to be contacting the parents of that missing individual to let them know. But going only so far and not contacting the police, a bit odd. 
I wonder what the conversation was like on the phone between such as the mother of Riley Strain and the fraternity brothers, the friends of Riley Strain. Okay, the conversation of, we can't find your son. He's not at the hotel. Maybe the mother said, well, have you checked the area? Have you searched about? Have you contacted the police? How did the fraternity brothers respond to those possible questions? I don't know. But one thing for sure, they didn't contact the police within that 14 hour period. So something is definitely a bit off there. Okay. And as well, it just seems a bit disrespectful how the parents are concerned, worried and spending four hours traipsing her out from hospital to hospital to look for their son, whilst also hoping that he's not there because they don't want to see him injured or hurt or much worse. And then Riley's own friends can just get on with life. And then the next day on that day, when the parents are worried, just come on by and say, hi, you're all right. Yeah. Don't, don't you not remember what's just happened? It seems like they're either blocking it out or they've completely forgotten. Now, one other point that was mentioned by the parents talking about the hotel witness. Some person at the hotel which Riley Strain was supposedly staying at and the fraternity brothers too, the hotel witness reported there was lots of sounds and commotion on the 8th of March, okay? So by the time the fraternity brothers made it back to that hotel, in anticipating finding Riley, which wasn't the case, a hotel witness at that time stated through the walls and because of the heavy doors throughout the hotel and the, uh, what, what do you call it, the, not the rooms, but the, maybe the main floors with the heavy doors slamming shut and the, the, the students, the people being very noisy and loud and walking back and forth and even the sound of females as well with the guys, okay? Both males and females present. Were some invited over? I don't know. Hotel witness talking about new people coming on over as well at the time, new groups forming, and that some of the people were freaking out for some reason. Now, at that point, you could say well, maybe they're freaking out because that realisation of where's Riley at? But they were really freaking out. Why did they not take action or even later? Right? They couldn't have been that frozen. Um, then within that interview, I don't know who the other two people were on the side besides the parents, probably family members, correct me if I'm wrong, were saying how the additional story to that about people freaking out was simply because some guy hurt his hand on that night, but it's, it's not relevant to Riley Strain. A person hurt their hand and everybody's freaking out. The only reason why people would freak out is if the hand injury was gruesome, a bone sticking out or cuts and blood everywhere. If it was a bruise or a strain or a sprain, there would be no gore, there'd be no reason to freak out because there's nothing disgusting to see, right? I know people react differently, but still, there wouldn't be much reason to overreact then, okay? Now, with that being said, if it doesn't link to Riley Strain, who were those people then? Who were those people at that hotel? Were all, or, or at least some of them, friends of Riley Strain, or was it just strangers? I don't know, it wasn't quite confirmed. But some additional points that were added on, the mother did say that the frat brothers may be hiding something. That's what she genuinely believes at this moment, but um, Riley's friends could be hiding something, hence why the silence, and hence why the, the weren't forthcoming in helping or reaching out to police. The family feel that there's a hole in their heart and there will always be, and there's a bit of a void as well because they want answers and that hasn't happened yet. Mentioned in the interview as well by the family that the fraternity brothers have not reached out to the family. It's been the family reaching out and begging for answers towards the fraternity brothers. So the power dynamics there are in the wrong order, aren't they? And yet that's just how it's gone. So that definitely doesn't seem right there. There is room for concern and suspicion. It did say though that when the funeral occurred of Riley Strain, the students did come along on some kind of shuttle bus. They came and then left. So they at least attended that. The fraternity um, had some kind of vigil or some kind of gathering. And they told the family about it three hours before it started but it takes about three hours for the family to travel on down because they were living in different areas was that done on purpose that's what was being suggested and also the family in the interview were talking about how the fraternity itself could be protecting the fraternity brothers 
some kind of protection, protecting the students, the university. Now, <laughs> the last time I was thinking about a university protecting something or maybe hiding the truth was the Idaho 4 case with those four murdered students, supposedly by the hands of Koberger, who worked at the university within uh, Moscow, Idaho, right? So, are there some unknown forces in the background covering up the truth, hiding the truth, protecting the people responsible? Who knows? We just got to work with what we've got and what comes out next. There's still, well, there's probably more questions now than answers, which isn't a good thing, but, you know, like with the CCTV footage in the bars, if that can be retrieved, that could yield some kind of answers, some kind of awareness. And then once that's ticked off the list, you got to see where you go from there, whether it opens up new leads or it literally leads to a dead end. I guess time will tell. But yes, due to the behaviour of the fraternity brothers, it does seem a little bit suspicious. Either because of the age or mentality they are, they're not taking it serious enough, or they're somewhat responsible or may know something. I mean, there's not been much change since. Nowadays, you may expect a change in behaviour because of grieving for the loss of their friend, but for him to already be quiet from the beginning before knowing about the death of Riley, that is a little bit strange, right? So I want to know all your thoughts and opinions down below under this video. Let me know. I can read the comments out at some other point. We'll see what happens next. You never know if there's any twists or turns. As I said, make sure to catch up on my earlier video if you haven't already. Click on the eye symbol right inside of the screen and we'll go from there. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Goodbye. Good night for now.